Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, so. Oh, sorry. So this week, um, we have a very interesting um, personality theory. So this is the first uh, personality theory that we're going to discuss. Um, it falls into a very big category of inner psychic approach. So basically this approach assumes that human nature, a human behavior is a product of unconscious process. So basically we are driven, we are driven mostly predominantly by our unconscious processes. And um, this for this meeting, we're going to discuss the classical approach, the classical form of uh, inner psychic approach. Uh, it's from a, uh, psych a psychologist called uh, Sigmund Freud. He is very famous one uh, in psychology. Some, some, uh, some even says that uh, some people even says that uh, Freud is the most important psychologist all the time. I could disagree with that, but some people says that. Um, yes. Um, also, um, before we before I start the lecture, before we start the lecture, I. I also um, apologize for the slight disruption because I'm, I'm I'm in home with my daughter now, so maybe some slight disruption might happening sometimes. And also, I need you I need you I need you to wait a second because a students a student just give me a message and it looks like he doesn't know how to how to join the the, the zoom uh, the zoom room. So if you allow me for a few minutes, that would be uh, very much appreciated. Yes, um, we can continue now, I think. Right, so he's, so he's the guy, the Sigmund Freud, the, the, the famous guy. So um, he, started, he started his explanation about how human behavior, how human personality formed by describing a, an inner force that he called instinct. So basically, um, every human behavior even a pattern of be, even a human beha uh, behavioral pattern that forms personality is driven by this energy that he called instinct. So basically, he described instinct as a drive, as a motivational drive, and uh, it determines how a human behavior directed. And he even has a very specific German word, and and he called it triep. I don't know how to pronounce it. I hope I, I, I don't. I, I hope I didn't get it wrong, but it, it looks like it means a, a sort of a form of energy where a human could transform this energy into a um, a more like physical energy that connects the physical needs to psychological needs. So that's why he talked a lot about biological needs, uh, things like um, hunger and even sexual instincts. So that's why he is very famous of a uh, very famous of uh, proposing. Uh, how sexual instinct could uh, could take form into uh, behavior, normal behavior. So he proposed that a uh, human always experience this instinctual attention, and sometimes we cannot, but all the times we cannot ex escape from this tension. So what we can do, the best thing that we can do is to reduce and regulate the tension. So we cannot escape from this instinct, but what we can do is is that is to manage and regulate this instinct and also to reduce the tension, to reduce the inconvenience due to, uh, due to the tension from this uh, drives. And some people may have different ways to reduce it. Um, and for example, if, uh, if someone has, everyone has sexual drives, but, uh, but, but some people may have different approach how to release the tension, how to manifest uh, their sexual drives. So that's why it, it could uh, take form of many different uh, sexual behaviors. Uh, but it's also possible to replace the tension, to replace the instinct into something else. For example, if you have, um, for example, sexual drives, then you may replace or you may direct, redirect the instinct to, uh, to other behavior. So we can substitute the object as well. For example, um, uh, Freud has famously uh, proposing a story that uh, if someone has uh, uh, an instinct, uh, uh, an, an inner uh, desire to 
to to um, in a desire for homosexuality, for example, uh, the tension or the drives could take form into into other things. The, the, the substitution, uh, the objects could be substituted to other uh, to other objects. So, and the, uh, and how we basically how we move, how we uh, redirect this instinct is the main uh, is the main approach of his uh, theoretical system, and it determines how people how how one's behavior uh, could be explained in some ways. And even Freud, he uh, separates the idea of life instinct and death instinct. And even though those instincts are basic instincts, but it it could take a, a different form. Right. So my internet connection is unstable. Right. Yeah, and because it happens to everyone, every person has it. Every person has the in, this instinct, the same instinct, the, the, the same life and death instinct. He says that uh, this instinct is also a primal motivation. It means that it is inherent in our human nature. We, we were born with it, and it, it is inside us as a person. So that's why he coined the term uh, primal motivation. So it's the basic a motivation that drives all human behaviors. And the first one would be the life instinct because he uh, distingu distinguished between uh, the life and also the death instinct and it serves completely different function. So the first one would be the life instinct. So uh, this instinct, this particular instinct, uh, serves the purpose of survival. So you need this instinct to survive as a person and it satisfy the needs, the satisfy your physiological needs. So if you feel hunger, if you feel thirst, or if you feel um, um, in needs of a sexual relationship, then it would be uh, it would be caused by uh, by this life instinct. Why sexual instinct is categorized as this life instinct? Because in a human needs a sexual instinct to reproduce. So that's why. Uh, that's the the part of uh, the sort of uh, the, the the part of the uh, survival aspect of of the instinct. We need this instinct to survive as a species. And also, the life instinct uh, has an orientation of uh, growth and development. So that's why uh, he call it as a life instinct because these instincts could be directed to uh, to growth to the development. So that's why um, um, it's not only uh, it's not only an instinct to uh, to survive, but also it has an orientation to towards growth and development. Uh, and this uh, instinct could be also called as a libido. So libido is not on, only limited to sexual drives, but it also uh, basically covers all uh, physical needs that we have that we need to fulfill to survive as a as a species. And libido could be attached to to an object. So, for example, if you uh, if you have a sexual uh, sexual um, sexual arousal to an object, for example, to your boyfriend, for example, then it means that your libido is is attached to to an object, to a person. So, for example, if you like Ryan Gosling very much, then it it means that your li your libido is connected to 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 an object, to an object called Ryan Gosling. So, this is the guy, Ryan Gosling. And the next one would be the death instinct, and it serves completely different um, uh, different aims compared to life instinct. And uh, this death instinct, uh, the difference between life and death instinct is the orientation. So if life instinct has an orientation to growth and a development, but death instinct could be a completely different um, orientation. So it it is directed toward destructive, and it's more to death instinct, to, to destruction. And we also need that to, uh, to overcome threat. So for example, our ancestor, when they uh, experience, uh, when they experience a threat from their environment, for example, if they see a predator, predator animal, for example, a, a lion, then a death instinct would, uh, would uh, drive them to, to kill the lion in order to survive as a species. So we also need this death instinct. We need this destructive instinct to survive as well as a species. And the second, uh, the second uh, thing that that he proposed, which I think quite um, confusing at some point, 
Uh, Freud says that every living person has an unconscious wish to die. And I don't know why he said that, but he believed that uh, lots of people would have uh, would have a, a desire to uh, to kill themselves. I'm not sure why it could happen, but because if it happens to to a normal person, um, uh, clinically, it's 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 a it's a it's something that we need to that we need to uh, deal with. I mean, it 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 needs a, a professional help. But Freud says it's it, it is something very natural. Everyone has this unconsciously, which is quite interesting in this point. And the other component, uh, other component of this death instinct, uh, apart from the unconscious wish to die, is that we have we have also this aggressive drive. For example, if you uh, are exposed to a danger, for example, if you see someone who threat to kill you, then you will um, then you will give a defense attack. Of course, it it requires an aggressive uh, behavior to. To, to, to ensure that you to ensure your safety in this case um, so aggressive drift drives including strong impulsion to damage to kill to destroy to conquer and so on so this uh, death instinct is also one whole package of um, of this biological or uh, biological inherent drives of human nature that would be yes any questions so far about instincts before we moving on to other uh, to the next topic you can use chat if you don't need if you don't feel like you need to that you want to uh, talk directly you can use the chat uh, feature right so no questions so far um, and the next one would be the level of personality so after uh, explaining about the instinctual drives that moves that that, that, that gives the energy to human behavior. He also described the level of personality. He described that human personality uh, is divided into three different levels. So the first level is the unconscious, the deepest one, uh, that lies a lot of disturbing things, he says. And also the, the second one would be the preconscious. That would be the area between conscious and unconscious, unconscious and conscious. And the, the next one would be the, uh, the, the, the top, the highest um, level of personality is the conscious one. This is something that we have control over. So the different, um, so the different level of personality also reflects different uh, control that we have. So if we say something that, if we say something about unconscious process, it means that we have a very, very minimal level of control. But if we, if we say something about a conscious level of personality, it means that we have a higher degree of control. So it, I think this is a very interesting concept. It means that some part of us cannot be controlled. Even, for, even, even if we want to control it, we cannot control it. Especially uh, the unconscious uh, part. So the conscious, the first, uh, the, 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 the top, um, the top level of the of the personality would be the conscious. Um, um, it would be it, it it covers all the sensation and experience that you, of course, that you are conscious. Yeah. So your 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 perception and also your memories, and your basically your um, your your um, your touch with reality. So it. It's it's it covers the, the the conscious processes. So something your every experience that you aware at the moment, but it's very small compared to the unconsciousness. So if we um, so he also uh, so Freud also used iceberg the iceberg as the as the analogy of these three different levels. So the so the unseen part of your personality it's actually deep down the ocean. But on the tip of the iceberg is the conscious processes. Even though it's 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 clearly seen, but it's only the small part of your personality. So that's why, even though it's something that you are aware of, but it's only a small part of yourself, and you only have a very small degree of control over yourself. It's very small area on the top of the iceberg. So yes, that would be the conscious. And the second one would be the oh, so the unconscious so the this is the the deep down the ocean 
deep down the iceberg on deep down the iceberg it is the focus of the psychoanalytic theory so he uh, he focused a lot on the unconscious processes so that's why uh, some psychologists uh, categorize uh, psychoanalysis as the um, as the um, as the theory of unconscious process. Yes. Yeah, so because he describes a lot what happens in our unconscious processes, and also um, the unconscious processes leaves uh, the instincts that I've told you before. It it actually it placed it has a place. Excuse me, miss. Um, yeah. Any questions, concern? Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. And who is this? Okay, uh, Anska has Anska has a question. Uh, I'm Jess. One second. Yeah. yeah. Um, Do you have any questions or anything else? Uh, yes. Where of your un uh, of your unconscious personality, or is it just you? Or like you are also not really aware of your unconscious personality. You cannot change it, but do other people notice it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can actually we because it's deep down in unco in our unconscious part uh, of our personality. We cannot uh, we cannot easily aware of it. But uh, but Freud says that it could be it could be uh, brought into the conscious process. So it could be brought uh, up to the. Uh, uh, in, in your awareness by the help of the uh, uh, by the help of the therapist so the therapist basically will do a series of intervention psychological intervention to bring up all your unconscious processes into your conscious processes so if you are familiar with a uh, Freudian chair so if, uh, if the, the client sits on the chair and he and the client would be would basically tells the therapist everything that bothers them uh, psychologically, it's actually uh, a technique to uh, to bring all these unconscious uh, unconscious processes into conscious into the awareness. So it could you, you we cannot aware of it easily, but it's possible to bring up all of these unconscious processes into conscious into awareness by the help of, by the help of therapists. Does that make sense to you? Yes, thank you very much. Yep, all right. So that's very good. So um so this part, the 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 unconscious part is is a dark part because we don't have control and we don't uh, know what is inside this unconscious process. Uh, but the problem is that even though even though we don't know and we don't have control over that, it's the most powerful uh, most powerful um, part of our personality, which is quite interesting in some uh, in this case. And yeah, so the, the, the main key, the key words that you need to remember is that unconscious process, less control, conscious process, more control. So that would be the easiest uh, way to, uh, to describe and to distinguish between uh, conscious and unconscious processes. And the next one would be, yes, so this is, I think, the most interesting part of the level of personality. So if you have known about the top part, the conscious process, and also the deep down part, the the bottom part of our personality, that is the unconscious process. But there's also another part in the middle of that, and we call it preconscious or subconscious. So this is where your dreams are. So that's why I uh, I ask you to take note of the dream because it's a bridge to your unconscious processes. So I'll go into that uh, in the next part of this lecture but that is the most interesting part of human personality i would say so if you are interested in how preconscious work uh i recommend you to watch i don't know if you ever watched this movie uh it's called um the inception if i'm mistaken yeah inception so it even though most of uh, most part of that movie is fictional but it gives you the idea how preconscious work so if you see the movie if, if you see part of the movie it tells us the story that the one, uh, the, the person who, who has the job, who has the task to, to design the, to design the dream, uh, they often design the dream uh, uh, with their familiar situation. So it's impossible for you to imagine a place that you never visited yourself. 
So it always, uh, so the dream, uh, sometimes it contains a part of your reality, of your aware, uh, of your, uh, of your, your, of your awareness, and also some part of it, it also manifests your unconscious processes, which is quite interesting in this case. And uh, preconscious is also a, is also the home of your memories. That's why some of your memories may not be accurate. Some of it may so so some of us may confuse uh, re, real real events to our wishes uh, in our memories. So that's why I think it also uh, reflects uh, your desire, your, your unconscious desire as well. And of course, it's not easy to summon your, uh, your unconscious process into your preconscious, but it happens most often in your dreams. <laughs> yeah. And you may, you, may need, uh, you may have heard about Freudian slip as well. So if someone uh, says something that they don't really, that they are not really aware of, and it also reflects the... Uh, no. Sure. What? Yeah. Which, what do you say? The Freudian slip. The slip of tongue. So when you mention something that you, that you don't really mean to. Have you heard uh, of that? No. No, yeah, so I haven't heard. For example, if you, if you, for example, if you want to... If you intend to say something, but it's but you but in fact you say something else. For example, if I want to call my husband with his name, but in reality I mistakenly uh, mistakenly call him with my ex name, that would be Freudian slip because I might be aware of the existence of my husband, but maybe I'm thinking about my ex. So that's why I'm then I'm slipped my tongue slipped, and I'm calling my ex instead of my husband. It means that. Uh, it also reflects the idea of the activity of our preconscious. It may, uh, of some degree, that my that I that I might have uh, unconscious desire to talk to my ex instead of my husband. That would be the easiest uh, example to, to give you. Do that. Uh, not sure. If you if I'm starting bubbling, if you don't really understand what I mean, please let me know so I could give you a more sense explanation. Yeah. So, uh, sorry, I still have a question. Like, sure. um, in your example, you're calling then your ex name because the husband reminds you of our uh, of your ex. Mm -hmm. Well, in in that case, I, uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so in my example, I'm I'm trying to 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 to, to tell you that. Uh, if I'm calling my husband with my ex name, maybe without, uh, well, I don't have any intention to, uh, to, to call my ex name. I'm actually, I'm intending to call my husband, but my, my tongue says uh, an ex, my ex name, which means that I might have unconscious wishes to, um, to, to talk to my ex instead of my husband. That would be the, um, the explanation. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Okay. So um, the next one would be the um. Yes. So this is the uh, structure of personality. So you have learned about the levels of personality, the layers of personality, but now it's the structure of the personality. So we're going to um to join the idea of the layers of personality and also the structure of it. So um. So uh, Freud is quite famous in proposing the idea that our personality may have three components. I don't know why he liked three, everything three. Um, so the first one would be it, or in German, I would say, if I'm, if I'm mistaken, it's das es. And the, the second one would be ego, or das ich. And the third one would be super ego, or uh, das uber ich, if I'm mistaken. Um, so these three parts of the personality, three parts of, uh, of the personality, they serve different functions as well, which is quite interesting because uh, these three parts should be uh, coordinated uh, all together. If there's problems, if there's problems with how they manage to, uh, to share the instinct, the, ener the energy components, it would give you a problems. It gives you a lot of, it will cause a lot of uh, mental illnesses. So the first part of our personality is it, or in Latin would be it, but in German uh, would be das es. So it's as a, it, it serves as a reservoir of the energy. So instincts 
is actually a very important part of the it. So it, it contains all the libido, the energy, the, the psychic energy that when that then we direct it into behavior. So it's a very, very, uh, very powerful and it's a very important structure in 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 the whole theory in the whole uh, uh, theoretical system of psychoanalysis and it operates in a principle that he called a pleasure principle so basically it uh, you can imagine it as a person who wants uh, who wants everything and he 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 demands every he demands every side needs to be fulfilled so that's why um uh, it operates in in such principle called pleasure principle. So it uh, so it basically directs us to uh, to increase pleasure and avoid pain. So it's the Epicurean part of our personality. So if you have a tendency a ten, or attention to uh, to to seek for food, for example, or to uh, to seek for pleasure, so it's it's a manifestation of 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 it. Yeah, so it works. Uh, it it it's the activity of this uh, part of the pure personality. And uh, and it is a selfish. It's a pleasure -seeking structure. It's primitive. It's immoral because he doesn't understand uh, moral part because he only uh, because it only cares about how to fulfill his desire and that's it. I don't care about the situation, I don't care about moral norms and so whatever, but it has to be fulfilled. So this, so it operates in such ways. It's impulsive as well, because it, if, if it wants to, if it uh, contains sexual drives, then it needs to be fulfilled right now to fulfill uh, this, uh, this desire. And so that's why it has no awareness of reality. He doesn't care about how to do it, how to fulfill that, but he only cares about it needs to be fulfilled now. It cannot be. Um, it cannot be delayed. It has to be now, and so that's why um, the only ways that we fulfill this, uh, the desire that 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 is pertaining to it, is that by doing reflex action and even wish fulfilling hallucinatory or fantastic experience. So um, that's the uh, that's the, the the fast way, the quick way to fulfill this. Uh, fulfill these wishes and desire. So that's why Freud labeled this uh, this this it as also primary process thought. So it, because it concerns on uh, our primal primal needs, it's of course hunger first and sexual drives. So that's it. <laughs> that's it. That is it. Uh, have you any questions about it and how it works? Okay, no questions. So we're going to proceed on the next part of, of the personality that we call the ego. Uh, even though it um, is placed deep down in our unconscious process, because it is basically in the, 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 the bottom part of our personality, um, but actually psychoanalysis aim uh, is more concerned on the ego because Freud himself, he, he put a very, a strong emphasis to ego as the indicator of someone who has very good mental capacity or not. So ego is basically the police. So he regulates, he regulates, uh, he regulates it. So he, uh, he acts, it acts as the, uh, as the executor of the desire that it wants. So basically, the idea of it is the, is a uh, basis on it based on the concept that. Uh, when you, as you are growing up uh, as, a, as, as an adult, uh, people would expect you to be an intelligent, a rational agent that is up, that, that is capable to make your own decision. And it's actually a representation of healthy ego. It means that if you have a very good mental capacity to take a decision, to make decision, and to sort and to repress, and also to repress. Um, Oh, sorry, my internet connection is unstable. Right. So uh, ego has the ability to filter, to select which desire that needs to be fulfilled and which desire needs to be substituted or needs to be uh, replaced to other objects. So it's it works as a reality principle. So ego is a part of our personal is a part of our personality that has connection with reality. So if the ego wants something. If the it wants something, desires something, then ego will seek the way how to fulfill the desire. 
So that would be the very strong distinction between uh, it and ego. And so that's, uh, and because if, even though Freud himself realized that uh, human is basically irrational, uh, irrational species, but he would uh, say that, uh, well, the aim of being a human is that being a rational and intelligent person, so that we put a strong emphasis on ego. So that's why some people say that psychoanalysis is basically ego psychology, <laughs> because it's all about ego. How, how to um, maintain the ego so make it stronger than it. It doesn't have to be, it, 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 shouldn't, it shouldn't be weaker than it because if it's uh, stronger than the ego, it means that you are being irrational at some point. So that's why um, being intelligent, being rational is a manifestation of the activity of this ego. And so that's why Freud called this ability as a secondary process thought. It's not the primary process thought, but the secondary process thought. And it manipulates the environment because ego serves the function of executive functioning. So he seeks ways to, to fulfill the wishes of the id. So it's practical, it's realistic. So that's why it operates as a, uh, uh, in, in ways that uh, it, it works as a reality principle. And this is quite interesting. So the ego serves two masters because we, we have the third, uh, structure in our personality that we call super ego or the das uber ich and it serves two masters so ego is it's actually in the middle of it the the part the last part the bottom part of our personality and also the ego the super ego the top part that that um that covers that uh, that that contains the moral the social expectations and so on so ego has to negotiate between how we should uh, fulfill the wishes without violating the norms so which is quite interesting so so ego needs to balance between these two so if uh, it, uh, if someone has problems with their ego it, the ego is not strong enough to mediate between uh the it and also the super ego then that's when the mental uh, mental illness comes so i need you to wait a second because my my, my daughter is crying i need maybe like three seconds to to, to calm her Right. So, uh, and also, uh, ego has two uh, different functions. The first one is controlling and postponing. So, if you have wishes, it's impossible, of course. Uh, um, it's impossible uh, socially. If you, for example, if you want to eat now, for example, while you're attending lecture, that would be normally, <laughs> normally that would not be acceptable socially. So that's why ego has as a function to control and to postpone the uh, postpone the wishes. So, for example, in uh, in Muslims, we do have uh, we do have a uh, a, an order, uh, not an order. We have a, in in Ramadan, for example, we we do the fasting, and it's also the serves the function to to strengthen the ego. It means that even though we're hungry, we need to re repress the need to hungry, and we need to postpone the wishes until the right time. So this is the the, the activity of the ego. So even though, uh, even though the impulse, the need, the wishes, and the desire comes from it, ego would uh, serves as the executive function that determines which, uh, which wishes or desire that needs that, that should be fulfilled and how to do it, and which um, desire that needs to be postponed or delayed. And the next one would be, so Freud basically he argued that we need to protect ourselves to being overthrown by the id. So the purpose of psychoanalysis itself is to, is to, uh, is to give strength to the ego and make sure that it won't be overthrown by the id. So that's why this is the main purpose, to defend the ego so it, it won't be overthrown by the id. And this is the last part of the structure uh, that we call uh, the sort of ego, or the sort of ego. This is also the, the one of the more, uh, quite powerful because it reflects the ideas of right and wrong so it, when we uh talk about which which uh behavior is moral or immoral then we um of course this is the manifestation of super ego it contains the idea of right and wrong the eternal morality the science uh so this is what what we call uh, super ego and how and we develop this uh from the since the beginning by the by pray by by by, by receiving praise 
or uh, or, or getting punishment or maybe seeing an example from our parents and we learn this uh, uh, standard the moral standard from our uh, from our parents from our environment and so that um, of course that also uh, a very important uh, process that 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 uh, that forms our uh, that, that forms our super ego and that's what would be the, the first part of our super ego the idea of right and wrong and also the second part would be the, I, the ego io so it's a reflection of ourselves but it's not truly the reflection of ourselves but but uh, but a bit more like the idea of what we want us to be so it's like the ideal part uh the the the, the must the, the 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 something that we desire that we want to be but this is something that we don't that is that that, that is impossible for us to do to be not to, to do to be but it serves us to function uh what kind of moral standard that we have and that you need to remember that uh, super ego strives no of course it's not pleasure it, it's not pleasure seeking principle but it's no it's also not attainment of realistic goals as the ego but it's more like moral perfection so it's a it's it's a part of yourself that's striving for uh for for being perfect morally and so yeah this is the the idea the uh, very interesting um illustration of it ego and super ego this part would be the eight and it, it it is reflect it is reflected uh in 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 an in evil manner yeah so it's the worst part of ourselves but we still did it anyway and the, the second part would be the ego the, the the in the middle part but of course ego uh when it works as a executive functioning it is constrained by the moral standard the super ego right so this is the also very important part of the system of the theoretical system it's the anxiety so everyone has the anxiety of course everyone has this but uh freud specifically uh describes anxiety as a threat to the ego so when ego is threatened by the by the tense by tension of it for example that means that he that it needs to defend themselves while having this anxiety so anxiety is quite different from fear because fear Sometimes the object of something that you are afraid of, it's, it's pretty much quite realistic. For example, if you are afraid of a snake, that's quite realistic because, well, it's realistic because, you know, snake is dangerous. But if you are afraid of a clown or if you are afraid of height, for example, that, it, that it, we could say it's anxiety because, well, it's something that you don't need to be afraid of, but some people would, uh, would some people think that it's, um, it, it, it caused them anxiety and sometimes anxiety you don't really know what makes you afraid what makes you anxious so that's quite different from uh, from the usual fear because sometimes we don't know the source of this anxiety and so because it, yeah that's why so Freud described anxiety as a fear that is objectless so we, sometimes we don't know the the object we don't need to we, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to be realistic Sometimes we cannot find the source. We just feel inconvenient. We, we, we feel anxious, but we can't, we can't uh, precisely point out the object that makes us anxious, which is quite interesting. <laughs> it's more merely psychological. And in anxiety, it's a very important part of this personality theory because it basically, the, the, the onset, the, the early onset, the early symptom of neurotic and psychotic behavior. So if it, so someone with mental illnesses would first develop anxiety before they're having mental illnesses. So when you cannot, when you are fail, when we fail to cope with our anxiety, it means that we are being overwhelmed by the fear that is traumatic that we can cope, which causing us uh, long-term psychological problems. And the well, everyone has this, and everyone has the and basically human has a uh, has a way to cope with and to reduce this anxiety um but um of course this is something that we that we don't uh, normally have but in in children for example little children they have this anxiety and feel helpless because they they cannot um cope they cope with their anxiety by themselves so they that's why they need to they need help from from older adults to overcome anxiety but in adult life 
it's very difficult. If it happens to an adult, then we call it an infantile helplessness. It's a situation where we, and as an adult, we feel that we could not cope with our own problems and we feel like we cannot do anything to us to make ourselves better. So it happens when it happens to a an adult in adult life, then we call it as an infantile 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 helplessness. So uh, Freud has three different uh, anxiety. I don't know why he loves three. Everything is three. I don't know why. Um, so so he distinguished between three different anxiety. So the first one would be the reality anxiety. The, the, the second one would be uh, the neurotic anxiety. And the third one would be the moral anxiety. And yes. Right, so this is the first part of anxiety. Before we proceed to anxiety, if you have any questions, or maybe do you have any anxiety <laughs> by listening to my explanation? I hope not, but just in case. Any questions? No? Right. Okay, so the first one is reality anxiety. That means it's a fear of real danger. For example, if you have a phobia of reptile, for example, you don't really like you don't you really hate reptile. It is justifiable because some some of reptiles are are actually harmful and dangerous. Um, so if you are afraid of the virus, for example, it is it, it's real. It, it's real because the 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 fire is real, and it's actually good for us because if you are afraid of something, then you will respond it by, by, by doing a series of, uh, by, by making strategy to combat the, 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 the threatening situation. So maybe it's more like fight or flight response. So if you don't fight it, then you fly from the, then you avoid the, the, the danger. So it's, it's actually a very important response, a very important initiative because it helps us to survive. And, but sometimes, even though it's real, even though the cause of this anxiety is real, sometimes people give a very extreme response to this real threat. For example, if you see someone who cannot leave their home because they're afraid of die, maybe being struck by a car, or maybe, I don't know, maybe get killed by a person, by a random person, it's real, it's realistic. But it's too extreme. <laughs> it's too extreme. So some people would have problems with their person, uh, problems with their uh, with, with their psychology, psychological conditions, uh, it could go beyond this point of normality. And it, of course, it requires, it needs, uh, uh, it needs, uh, it, it needs a, a session with a, with, with a therapist, of course. And the second would be the neurotic anxiety. This is something that is quite different from, uh, from the realistic uh, anxiety because it has a basis uh, in our childhood experience. So maybe if a a, a, a children a ch maybe if children get punished um, overtly for expressing their sexual uh, sexual impulses, maybe uh, if a boy get punished because of because they, because he he did masturbation for example, it could gives him neurotic anxiety, and this is like unconscious fear of being punished, so it roots back to the childhood experience. So that's quite different from the realistic um, uh, anxiety. And the third one would be the moral anxiety. So it happens because of the conflict between it and superego. It could happen when you have a desire to do something while this behavior, this wishes, it, act, it actually against the normal or the moral codes that, uh, that, is, that, is, that flies in your situation or the norms. Um, so it could give you a conflict. For example, um, so if you have a sexual impulses, for example, in, if you live in, uh, in Indonesia, for example, that would be quite a problem because um, most Asians or even Indonesians, they condemn any sexual, offered sexual, um, sexual um, expression. So that would be, it would cause more anxiety because there is a tension between what one wishes and how the situation that, that he experiences. And of course, it happens when we have uh, a contrary condition between it and, and, and super ego. And it causes a moral emotion that we call shame and guilt. So it affects someone. Some, some, sometimes it pushes uh, this person to repress their wishes instead of 
uh, releasing their wishes. And also, moral anxiety is a function of how well developed super ego is. And it happens as well when the children punished when when the when children violate the moral codes or the rules that the that the, the parents uh, have established. And of course, this shame is and guilt is the most important moral emotion that happens in this uh, as the outcome of the anxiety. And the purpose. Yeah, so why we need to experience this anxiety, it's a warning actually. So if someone feels that they are being anxious, it means that there's there's a problem with this with their personality system. So it's it's actually a symptom that something is wrong with the whole system that we have. Uh, so that's why uh, also uh, pushes this person to take action to strengthen the ego and to balance all the system. Um, so that's why anxiety is actually very, it's, it's a good thing because it tells us that there is something really wrong with our personality. And then how should we protect the ego and also to balance all the system? Um, Freud says that we have different strategies, we have ways, we have mechanism to make the ego stronger and to defend themselves and also to balance all the system. So this is the um, defense mechanism that Freud proposes to strengthen the, uh, strengthen the ego. Uh, the first one would be repression. So we choose to repress the wishes or the need or the desires that causes us anxiety, or maybe denying denying the existence of the threat. For example, if you are afraid of the virus and it causes you it causes you an inconvenience, for example, then you just like mm, I deny the existence of the virus. I don't really think that it happens. Okay, so if if you can give me just four seconds, Aya, tolong ya. Okay. Itu tuh pipis sama ayah yang Okay. Right. So um, the second would be the reaction formation. So um, it involves an expressing an impulse that is opposite. For example, if you see someone who is very very religious and they strongly opposes pornography, for example, it could also reflect that this person may desire a lot of um pornographic <laughs> pornographic materials so so someone would react com uh, uh, completely the outside of their wishes to strengthen their ego yeah it's quite interesting or maybe we could do projection for example if you really angry with your parents and you are not allowed to express it then what you do is that you project to someone else so that would be um to you project to someone else that you feel safer to to release your anger or we could do the regression this is quite um this is also an, an indication that that this person has a as a as a severe mental illness uh, maybe uh, someone would respond a uh, fair threatening situation by regressing themselves into uh, an earlier part uh, earlier a part of their life for example if someone behaves like a child um while they're actually an adult it's actually the way the, the the strategy that they that they do to protect themselves from the threatening adult situation but when it happens it means that this person has a quite um, disturbed mentally i would say <laughs> we could do rationalization it means that um when you do a mistake instead of admitting your mistake and you start making excuses night it also um we call it as a rationalization or displacement, you could also displacement. It means that if you really, really angry with your girlfriend, for example, then what you do is to punch your, punch the wall, is to release your anger. It means that you displace your anger to another object that is less threatening than, than the actual object because it's impossible to punch your girlfriend, right? So that's why you, maybe you punch the wall because it's less threatening and it's more, more possible to punch that instead of the, 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 the actual object. Or perhaps you, someone could do sublimation, which means that if you are very frustrated with the virus, for example, then what you do is that you're writing a poem or writing a, or writing a song that reflects your anxiety to release that. So it's also a way to, to, re, uh, to redirect, the, uh, redirect the, uh, the threatening situation into a more productive and more acceptable response. And this is also the ones quite interesting. Um, so Freud also mentioned the 
the development of psychosexual stages. So basically, as a human, we developed uh, different ways to uh, different ways to um, to to develop our personality. And these psychosexual stages is also determined by how uh, our parents uh, respond to our needs as well. And as you may remember that libido or the energy could be attached, could be attached to an object. Uh, it also works in the psychosexual stage because our needs, our desire, or in our sexual drives is attached to different objects uh, throughout the development of uh, uh, the development of personality. So the first one would be maybe I'll just go into uh, to the uh, the first stage is the oral stage. It means that our sexual drive mainly attached to the mouth, to the to the lips, yeah, to the oral part. Uh, it means that uh, it uh, it goes in the um, in the first stage in over, and it lasts from birth until the second year. So it during the breastfeeding uh, the breastfeeding um, period because you know of course we need we need lips we need this with the oral to uh, the baby needs the uh, needs their lips to suck the milk from the breast because it basically that's the way how the way how uh, it's how they are survived as a species because they get the emotional bond and also the the the, um, the food from the from the um, from the breast from the breast milk from the breastfeeding process so yeah that's why it's um, the, the 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 source of pleasure so the sexual drive attached to the mouth so the pleasure as so the mouth is the, the center part of the center part of the pleasure so that's why infants shows a pleasure from sucking, from biting, and swallowing. Because that's what happened in this uh, period. And infant is, of course, the baby is completely dependent to the mother because, no, well, a baby could not even survive without the mother. No breastfeeding, of course. And so that's why uh, it says that uh, Freud says that the mother is the primary object of the child's libido. So the libido centers around the uh, around the mother, around the Mother as the primary source of the pleasure, and there are two ways uh, how the infant uh, behaves in this uh, in this period. The first one, okay, it's unstable. So the first one would be oral incorporative and also oral aggressive. Yeah, so it's completely different uh, ways to 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 uh, fulfill the pleasure. To, to, to pleasure. So oral incorporative means that the the baby normally taking in taking in uh, the breast milk, or maybe also being aggressive by biting or uh, spitting out the food, perhaps. And if someone, if a person could not uh, cope or could not completely fulfill the needs of the needs uh, during this period, it means they are fixated. Or attached to this to this uh, stage. If you see someone who excessively eating, drinking, and smoking, or maybe has a very excessive wishes to kiss, or maybe doing oral, oral sex as well, it means that it's also an indication why uh, an indication where uh, the oral period has not been uh, pleased, has not been fulfilled, or satisfied uh, in their early lives. And the second would be the anal stage. And sometimes it's quite disturbing to uh, to discuss about this uh, uh, of these stages. And this anal uh, this anal stages quite uh, it's quite strongly associated with um, the toilet training. I don't know why, but Freud says that uh, the children has a pleasure to to delay to delay their their defecation. So they have they, they they will feel a and an unprecedented a pleasure when when they when after after delaying the defecation but then it come out and it feels like fulfilling he says that i don't know why but it doesn't make sense to me but he says that and he said that and in this stage we are learning we were learning about delaying uh delaying uh, pleasure so that's why in toilet training uh, the, the most important part of toilet training is that the children need to um, to 
ada to hold ya yeah, to hold to hold the the impulse to you know to pee or to to poo everywhere so that is the the goal of this stage postponing the and delaying the the, the pleasure and there are two different uh, possibility uh, maybe someone could be if you see someone who has maybe um, obsessive or compulsive disorder they are very be, being compulsively neat and overly conscientious very rigid normally uh, morally um, or maybe hoarding thin things and maybe they they being stubborn and stingy it means that they are fixated they are attached to this stage it means they it means that uh, back to the their earlier life this period of this period of psycho psychosexual development has not been satisfied properly so that's why it happens uh that we call uh, obsessive compulsive uh, disorder that's also one of the uh, explanation why you could do such um, illogical behavior and someone could be anal aggressive so hostile and sadistic behavior also roots back into the the problems in this uh, in this very stage and if someone shows cruelty destructiveness and even temper tantrums have have uh, difficulties in dealing with their own emotion uh, it roots back into this um, the stage uh, and Freud even proposes that proposed that there are lots of problems it may not it might not be uh, satisfied properly and this one would be phallic stage um not sure if you familiar with phallic in what, what phallic means in latin it's penis basically <laughs> so um in this age uh the children they they start to explore their own genitals and they start to play with their own genitals and this one uh, in this stage uh, there is a very important conflict that we call uh, oedipus complex not very sure whether you have heard about this so basically in this stage a boy have a desire to kill his own father because he has a desire sexual desire towards his mother that's quite disturbing <laughs> but yeah but that's um, that's what he says and it's a taboo basically but it inherent in many many cultures um so that's a very difficult conflict to resolve here yeah? how to basically to to hit uh the sexual intention sexual direction to to the mother and avoid the anger of of the father so that's the idea of this phallic stage um so oedipus complex has two different parts so the first one is the of the sexual drives towards the mother and also the fear of the father. So a boy would fear his father because he is afraid of the idea that his father would punish her, punish him, uh, punish him due to having the sexual desire towards the mother by castrating. That doesn't make sense, but that's what the what he says basically. So um, so the father would would uh, scare the boy to castrate his fetus by expressing their sexual desire because the boy is um is driven to 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 to, to show to express their sexual desire uh, this desire to uh to to the mother yeah that, that is very disturbing but that's what happened <laughs> um and the the fear of being castrated it is also called castration actually so the idea that the father will castrate uh, his penis that this is something that that is something that the uh, that freud called uh, castration injury and because freud was famous was notoriously hates women he, he was famous for being misogynistic he doesn't he basically he didn't actually uh take women into account he, he will basically he says that he, he explicitly say that women has envy and and it being envious to the to the man because men has penis and we women we don't have penis so that's why we, we are being envious to to men of the of having of having penis that's also disturbing but um and but which is quite interesting because uh because after after freud says uh, after freud proposed uh penis in invite uh a later psychoanalyst uh, psychoanalyst uh women's psychoanalyst, the only one 
uh, women psychoanalyst, uh, Karen Horney. She said that women also, uh, men also has a quite similar uh, feeling, similar envy, envy because, um, because men cannot bear children while we women, we could have the ability to bear children. So that's why he call, uh, she called it a uh, warm envy. And we're going to talk about Karen Horney's theory a bit more later in this course, because I myself, I think that it is more comprehensive and I kind of like it's more logical than Freud one. Any questions? Do you have any questions so far? No? Okay. And the next one is the latency. This is the something that is quite invisible. Nothing actually, imp nothing important happens in this stage uh, because in this stage, children are busy doing their school activity. So there is no um, substantive uh, sexual, uh, sexual uh, activities in this, uh, in this stage. And the last one would be the genital stage. Uh, so this is the stage where uh, where children move their catexis object to outside their family. So when in in the in earlier stage, the object that gives them sexual pleasure is inside their body, their own body or their own family. But in the genital stage, they move the the sexual object, the, the pleasure object, to other people, to other person outside their family. So this is the stage where you uh, start when we start uh, looking for romantic partner and start to develop a romantic relationship. And if someone is a psychologically mature, then will lead to a normal life, hopefully. If no major fixation, no major problems happening in the earlier stage, then someone would have a normal life at this stage. This is less conflict, less intense, because, you know, we know how to conform with a social expectation so of course this is something that as long as no problems attached to especially in phallic uh in phallic stage because that's the most crucial conflict where uh, that happens there um then it is normal life okay so this is the um the the short um summary of of uh, five different stages of psychosexual development Right, so in order to say uh, uh, techniques, oh yeah, so um, someone asked me about, someone just asked earlier about how to uh, actually realize our own unconscious processes. So this is the techniques that uh, they commonly use with, uh, to, their, uh, to his patients uh, to help them resolving their conflicts that happens in their unconscious processes. So the first one would be pre-association. So in this process, uh, the therapist uh, will act as if the old, uh, the as the object of the anxiety. For example, if someone has an anxiety to his father, then the therapist would will act as if he is the father of the of his client, and the client would 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 uh, and and also the therapist will let the client to say anything that he wishes to say to his own father. So that's the idea of free association. And it's quite similar to catharsis. So basically, catharsis means that the therapist let the clients to uh, to say anything that he wishes to say. And the last one would be hypnosis. This is the most controversial technique. No one actually uses this. Well, some people may still use it, but it's not quite recommended by uh, by, my, by most psychologists because it 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 gives us more problems than it actually can solve. Uh, some clients, some patients, they show more severe uh, symptoms after being hypnotized, and they often deny whatever they say under the condition of being hypnotized. So, and some people would just, it completely fail, so they could be hypnotized at all. So that's why it is not recommended, not strongly recommended by, uh, by most psychologists, I would say. This is the last part, and that's the most important part, because this is something that you need to do in your project, in your assignment, as part of your assignment, is that dream analy and analysis. So this is not quite scientific, I would say. It's something that looks like 
I don't know, paganism, I would say. <laughs> so, uh, basically, Freud believes that it's, it's completely pseudoscientific, but, well, it is quite interesting, but I'm not very sure about the validity of the, of the theory, uh, because it also uh, strongly influenced by the culture as well, and we have different uh, interpretation of dreams. Every culture, they have different uh, interpretation about about what you see, what we see in a dream. So basically, Freud believes, he strongly believes that the dreams represent our unconscious wishes, fears, anxious, anxiety, and conflicts even. And, um, but sometimes we unconsciously repress it because we don't want to express it uh, uh, publicly because it's, it's very disturbing. So that's why we try to repress it into our unconscious part of ourselves. Uh, so if we repress it constantly, then it will come up without, uh, without realizing in a form of a dream. And there are two aspects of dream. There is a manifest dream, the manifest content, and also the latent content. So for example, if you really, really miss your girlfriend, for example, your, your girlfriend might appear in your dream. It's quite, mani it's, it's manifested. I mean, it's, it's, it's manifest as your girlfriend without any symbolic objects. But sometimes it's quite latent, so you need to play, you need to be a bit more creative in, in interpreting the dreams. Uh, so this is the um, the example of uh, of dream symbols. So if you see smooth front house, it also it actually represents male body, and when you see king and queen, it it actually represents parents. And if you maybe if you um, if you see, if you feel that your tooth is extracted in your dream, uh, which is quite interesting because Freud would interpret it as a fear of castration. But in some culture, for, for example, in Indonesian culture, if, if someone dreams that they, their, their, tooth, their tooth are extracted, it means that someone in their family members will die very soon, which is quite, well, this is, again, this is not quite valid scientifically. That's what happened. And if you feel yourself being naked in a crowd, if you see some, if you see yourself naked, being naked in a crowd in your during your dream, it's actually it's unconscious wishes to be noticed by other people. And falling, if you if you see yourself falling during the dream, during your sleep, and it's actually a desire to return in state of childhood because you don't feel comfortable with your own life and you wishes to come back to your own uh, to your childhood era to feel more uh, to feel more protected and i often have dream actually i often have a dream to be late to school even though i'm not in school anymore but i don't know why i i get dream a lot and it happens to be it's my it's actually my unconscious wishes to be perfect to, to have moral perfection so it's it's quite interesting to uh, putting our dreams. Sometimes the content of of the dreams actually quite related to our own life because the setting, the school setting, is actually the it's actually it was my school, my high school, and I felt actually I felt the the, the fear of being like, but I was able to to actually do thing that I need to do to to, to not being late, which is quite interesting. So that is actually the. Um, it's actually a representation where I have this moral standard perfection, where I act, actually I could not achieve this moral, my moral standard, which is quite interesting. So this is some, um, I'll give you some materials in regards to uh, dream symbols to help you to interpret your own dreams and to have a better knowledge of your unconscious wishes or desire. Um, so if you have any questions at all, please do ask it now or anything else that I could help, just let me know. And the last one would be I um I ask you very kindly to give me your student email. Doesn't have to be UNEF student email, but your university student email, so I could invite you to a Google Classroom because I believe that not every one of you have good internet access. So I'm trying to move. I'm trying to seek for alternatives by making a Google Classroom. But the problem is that I could only invite students with student email account. So I can I cannot. I cannot invite students with free Gmail account to the Google Classroom. So please let me, if you, uh, if you're not, if you are now available, please do, please go to the chat 
uh, chat feature and uh, and write down your uh, student email there. It, if you use your um, your university your home university student email account, that would be fine because it would it will work too, I guess. So if you are if you can, please do um, give me your um, your email account there. Any questions so far before before I end the lecture?